you're the Florida version of Sex in the City, dude. That's why I was smoking my cigars. <laughs> never stop chasing your dreams. And never say never. Don't be an asshole today. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, all right. She made it. Made it. So. We are fortunate enough to have uh, uh, Josie Malave, I think her last name is, Josie Malave. Yes, um, yes. Was, uh, on the, I think it was the first season of Top Chef from Bravo TV. Uh, second. Second season. Season two. Oh, great. <laughs> Reminds me of Diamonds and Pearls. <laughs> oh, yes. Hey, <yay>. <laughs> okay, guys. Ladies, oh. what's up? Hey, you. Being here. Thanks. We finally made it. Here we are, rocking and rolling right here. Look at you. <laughs> we, we got you out of the kitchen. Oh, yeah. yes. <laughs> That's rare. We're excited. Uh, I'm a, yeah. I'm very I'm starstruck. Ah, oh, come on. <laughs> I haven't. I, I, I myself, like, really ruin boiling eggs so it's like to you know i i saw you on season two of top chef but i'm extra starstruck because of the amazing things that you create in the kitchen because <laughs> i literally ruined a thaw and serve pie and boiling <laughs> eggs <laughs> well, that works that works <laughs> i can tell you this <laughs> much right now that uh i went to see jd's um new place and she had been in it, well, I don't even know what, I think about a month and a half. And yeah. um, all the peel away, all the peel away <laughs> stuff was still on the oven. And when you opened it, all the all, all the racks had a, like, everything stacked inside. Like, she hadn't even she hadn't even touched the oven yet. So Yeah, it sounds like, like you need me. You need you need yes, a night I in. Do. Yeah. I you need a, a, a night I in with Josie, honestly. <laughs> yeah, well, yes. listen, you know, I, I don't know, uh, you could just, you could just text me, you know, you don't have to hit me up via uh, the internet, you know, the, the social media. I know people think that I'm on there, but it's not always me. So sometimes right. you see things oh. like just posting, 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 posting. It's because I automate it. So perfect. Yeah. You know, so I mean, I'm not always there. You're busy. I get that. You got well, it. I'm a little less busy right now, but I mean, you, I'm, you, I'm, you I'm always got, busy. You got bubble, bubbles and pearls, right? Yeah, bubbles and pearls. But I, I don't know if you heard, but just uh, just yesterday, I uh, I closed the doors. So, oh, wow. yeah. oh, I'm, I'm coming back in December. <laughs> Where am I going to eat? Uh, <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, you know. It was a it, it was a very hard decision for me, but you know, uh, onwards and upwards. Yeah, onward and upwards. Yes. You know, when one door closes, 21, 20 doors that were meant for you open. So, you know, yeah. sometimes um, <clears throat> I think that you probably can relate. Um, but I'm a, I'm a, I'm about to be fifty this year, so I've seen a lot of doors close in my life, and I've seen a lot of doors open. And what I know and what I trust is that when one door closes, the doors that reopen or that open for you are the ones that are meant for you in the moment. And as hard as it is for people to let go of or, or you know, close a chapter or move on or okay. recognize, you know, acknowledge when things are not working or they're not for you or they're not they don't feel right and they're not feeding your soul and they're not doing all those things uh you know we we have as the human as human beings a little bit of an attachment problem you know <laughs> and yeah. we attach ourselves yes. to things that aren't so great for us right. and um you know sometimes you just gotta move on and you have to be willing to let things go uh and be willing to accept the change and the evolution of you because yeah. Yeah. You are always going to vibrate and reflect in your surroundings exactly what and where you're supposed to be. So that's, I guess that's where I'm at right now. <laughs> 100%. But you know what? That's it's, it's, it's fortunate that you, that you recognized it 
because sometimes that you can't see the forest through the trees, you know, and you and you share sure. something totally. that's not good for you. So yeah, yeah. But it was. Uh, I mean, it seems like it's been quite a journey. And my question, I think, is: Did it make it harder after being on on Top Chef than it would have having not been? on television and now being recognizable and having a little bit more pressure. If you were just kind of coasting through chef world, you know, would it have been a little bit easier? You know, that's a tough question. I'm going to be honest with you because obviously I, I'm so grateful for every experience, the good, the bad, the ugly. Yeah. I'm so grateful for all the folks I've met over the years. Um, you know, I'm so grateful for the opportunities that I've had, all of those things. Um, but, you know, somewhere down the line, like you kind of lose your ability to have an anonymous life. Yeah. And that's the part that you kind of trade off because with that, with that, um, with that stardom or that, that constant stage light on you. Yeah. Yeah. When you're human, you're human in front of everyone. And, you know, that can be interpreted many different ways. When you fall, you fall in front of everyone. You know, you have an audience for every yeah. single thing that you go through in your life. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, what is, yeah, and what it's done for me is it's just built a lot of characters. So, you know, I have a little bit thicker skin than most people because, <laughs> man, <laughs> you know. Yeah. I've fallen on my oh, face. Yeah. I've had to get back up. I've fallen many times, in a matter of fact, because I'm not afraid to fail. Right. And that's the part that I think um, being on Top Chef has made it hard to do is to fail in the public eye all the time and be right. human. Like, right. it's already my personality. Yeah. I, I would have been this whether I was on TV or I wasn't, you know? Right. right. So... Yeah. Just now I have an audience for every single step of my, uh, every single step of my journey, every single, every single triumph, every single, you know, again, uh, you know, disappointment, every single breakup, every single yeah. transformation, every single evolution, you know, yeah. um, every single mistake, you know, there's just no, there's so I, I have a thing now that I really live by and I'm like, no perfect people allowed, you know, like just yeah. no perfect people allowed because <laughs> the reality of it is, is we're all going to make mistakes because we're human. Yeah. And uh, the idea that anyone really thinks they are perfect. Yeah. We're perfect, whole and complete. Okay. Like, you know, the accepting of yourself, that that's like an esoteric kind of conversation. <laughs> but what I'm talking about is like, you know, there's actually people out there who think they're perfect and there's nothing to do with their lives. And they just have, they have no work to do on themselves and they have nothing to improve. And there's just, they know it all. And it, it's just what it is. Right. <laughs> but forget about those people. I don't want, I don't want perfect people around me. You know what I mean? Cause then they're lying to themselves and they're then they're just liars, you know? Exactly. <laughs> and I'm very, very quite, honestly, I feel like I've probably learned the most from my failures. Mm -hmm. You know? I mean, you, you, oh, yeah. you walk, right. You yeah. walk away with big lessons and you gotta be, you gotta be open to accepting the fact that, you know, I failed, but, you know, I learned, you know, I learned something from that and I'll learn something the next time I fail. So it can't, you know, be this huge write off. Like there, there are, ben you know, there's, there, there's silver linings, I guess we'd call them, you know, I mean, I, it, I, I don't know to me, it's, it's, it, I, I would imagine it'd be harder with, with a lot of eyes on you, but Again, I think, yeah, you have to look at the positives and, you know, the next, the next thing you do, you'll learn from before. It's a, that's just how it is. Like, you know, like fucking up a dish, you know, you know, yeah. like, <laughs> oh my God, you know, yeah, right? how many of those have I done? And it's crazy because they're, you know, people go, oh my God, you know, they, they must think that everything I cook is perfect. I've made terrible things before, you know, like just terrible, <laughs> like put it in your mouth and spit it out terrible. I'm like, what happened? You know, that I like. <laughs> 
I grabbed the wrong bottle of spice, you know what I mean? Or, or I grabbed the wrong ingredient or I was being too adventurous and avant-garde. So I decided to like, oh, let's just put these two together because it sounds good. I mean, those were more in the like earlier stages of my life, but <laughs> yeah, because you know, now you kind of learn what goes together and uh, you could just yeah. do, 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 you know, it's like a color palette, right? Yeah. But or I think you find that you love what you cook because you cooked it. So it's going to be like sometimes like an artist that has a terrible song just because they're famous, people are going to love it because it's their song. Like, do you ever feel like, you hate the dish, but people taste it and they're like, oh, it's amazing. <laughs> Absolutely. That's happened more often than not. I'm just like, I just don't even get that dish. But, uh, you know, like there was a, you know, like at Bubbles and Pearls, like the flatbreads, right? Everybody loves a flatbread. That's why we had them. But then it's sometimes... You know, I felt like I was a pizza joint and I'm like, God, guys, you know, <laughs> venture outside of the flatbread zone, you know, <laughs> but they, I, you know, we put some good toppings on those flatbreads, you know, we made, yeah. we made some, you know, adult style, uh, you know, a soprasada ricotta type of, of flatbread. And that was a big, uh, a big, um, winner with the, with the crowds. And I always called that the, uh, the adult pepperoni pizza you know yeah, yeah. it's like exactly. you know so brasada and this this herb filled ricotta and parmigiano reggiano and a little bit of mozzarella <laughs> and and then finished with the arugula and it tossed in a little bit of olive oil with just a hint yeah. of lemon <laughs> and you know season and it would just be like the perfect it I mean, it was good. I'm not going to lie. But I just got really annoyed that everybody always loved all these uh, flatbreads. <laughs> you know, here I am making these beautiful other dishes. And I'm like, okay, I guess flatbread it is, you know. Uh, <laughs> that's so funny. But, that's it, that's so, like, I was going to I was gonna ask you if you felt um, at all, you know, being being in, in, in Miami is one thing because there's so much culture. You know, there's so much right. culture and, and it, it it's so adventurous as far as food goes. But then, you know, you got people that come in that are like the pasty white tourists and I'll take <laughs> our flatbread pizzas, you know, and you, <laughs> and I thought, oh, God, like, yeah, I can see, you know, where that would be. Um, I, yeah, like monotonous, you know what I mean? To to. um to see them responding to such a <laughs> such a non-adventurous dish. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? like, like a, the home of like cricket tacos. You know what I mean? Like there's a yeah, those adventure. Have you had one? I have never had one, but I'm dying to try. I, I would I would kill to try one. Yeah. Yeah. I um you get if you go to Mexico or uh, some places in LA and San Francisco, you'll find the cricket tacos. And uh, they're really good actually, because they're just, they're crispy little guys. And you don't even, you can't even tell that they're, you know, once you put the cabbage and some cilantro and, and the salsas on it, it just yeah. tastes like something fried in, you know, like a chicharron and yeah. it's, it's delicious. Right. I mean, I personally, I'm, I'm going to tell you, the, I'm going to tell you the truth, right? I don't, I don't necessarily eat all the bugs and the weird things because I don't really feel the need to, right? right? Because there's so many other ingredients. Like if I'm starving, I'll eat some crickets. Like really, you know. But I'm not like, <laughs> no, I, I'm, 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 yeah, you know, like I'm not craving crickets. You know what I mean? It's like. I have some crickets in my cupboard right now. I'm not craving crickets, but uh, yeah, that's if just, I'm in a special place and that's the specialty, I'll eat it, you know. But yeah. I'm not searching it out. <laughs> uh, no. This is, this ain't an episode of Fear Factor, you know. We don't have to eat bugs, yeah, right? You know, you know is there money on the line here? Like, I don't. Yeah, exactly. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> <You're laughs> me. Yeah, that's just it. But yeah. yeah, that's what I feel like. I feel like. I, so so I'm in London, right? And I oh, and I, I love London. It's it's fantastic, and I'll take shit for saying this, but I hate the food here. I hate it. Oh, I hate, oh. I hate here. Here's the, I hate when they try and do something American. 
Oh, like mm. it's like mm. oh, 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 baby, no, that's no, no, <laughs> no. But you, you know, I went to London and they brought me there to film a pilot. It was called Eats and Beep, and I thought it was gonna get picked up. Honestly, it was a great. It's like totally my vibe, music, uh, you know, defining culture and yeah, destination yeah. through food and music. And I was there and they took me to this place and I, I had been eating throughout London. And when I was on, on screen, I was like, man, everyone told me that the food here sucked. And I thought this was delicious. And I was like, <laughs> I've only found delicious food in London. And they go, hey, Josie, can we retake that? You can't say that the food sucks in London. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I will say that. I'm like, well, everybody knows this. It's it, you yeah. still, there are places there are, there are places where it's really really good, you know. Like I will uh, I'll say that much. There there are places where it's really really good. Um, like last night we some went to send yeah right? some of those pop exactly. Last night I went to Z, I went to ZZ's, which is kind of like a chain ish Italian restaurant, and um and I had um. Pasta with uh, mushrooms, truffle, burrata, you know, again, with the arugula and mixed, they put arugula on everything. Um, oh. And and it was really, it was fantastic. Like it was really, really good. And then there's times where like, if it's not an upscale pub and it's just a normal high street pub, the food's going to be like, eh, you know, eh. <laughs> Standard bland sausages, mashed potatoes, you know. But I will say, well, you I don't like the smashed peas. I love those things. The mushy peas. <laughs> yeah, the mushy peas. Yeah, man, that's that's so delicious. Because they put because they put mint in it. Yeah, it's, it's really so good. good. I don't know, and I know. I look. I know that not everyone makes good um, mushy peas. Okay, yeah. but there's some people like I. I had it at the hotel that I was staying at in their their dining room and the chef you know he was trying i think he was trying to show off honestly but he you know they blanched them they were still green it was so beautiful and it was you know just smashed just perfectly and they had this it was seasoned perfectly it had like olive oil in it it was just like delicious yeah. and i was like i would I, you know i love peas i don't have a problem with peas you know but uh <laughs> I also had them at, and I'm probably going to get killed for this, but it's a it's a famous um, fish and chip spot. Rick, Rick and Steins? Rick Stein. Oh, I think that's what it's called. Yeah, and yeah. it's uh, yeah, and it's like in this little hip and neighborhood, but it's like you know every everything was in kind of a, a proper London proper, you know. Yeah. and uh, they everyone was telling me. Oh, that's mental. These are mental. Everything is mental, you know? <laughs> yeah. And I was like, what's mental? That you know, it's like, oh, cool, like mind yeah. blowing or whatever it is. So I love all the like lingo of London. I've made a really good friend who's a who's an energy alchemist. His name is Neo Hart. If you ever get a chance to go see him, he's an LGBT. Oh. He has um he has this um this deck. It's called the Fembot Oracle. And he's a gay man who's Egyptian and uh, British and his father was from the UK. His mom is from Egypt. He lives there in London. I'm going to go visit him. He's he's told me he's going to take me around to show me where all the good food is. Oh, he God. lives in Hackney, and I, yeah. I I can't wait to come back. I I really enjoyed London so much. Hackney is oh no, Hackbridge. Never mind. <laughs> I was going to say Hackney is close. No, it's Hack I'm close to Hackbridge. Um, uh. But yeah, there, there. That's what I mean. There's pockets of places that have amazing. Like I love. I've always loved food in Brighton, and I don't know if it's just because it's the queerest place, you know, in all of England, or uh -huh. you know, or if I just love the food there. But my my wife is uh, uh, <laughs> vegan and gluten free. And oh, very well, fun to eat. But <laughs> very <laughs> <good. Yeah. laughs> but there's well, a, there there is a place you. in oh. Brighton. And um, we went for uh, one of her birthdays and I, I swear to God, I would have never guessed. I mean, no, actually there's two places in Brighton that we've been that are, are, have all the, that tick all the boxes for her. And one of them was a Japanese restaurant and another one 
was just a um just a flat out you know vegan restaurant and every single thing that i've ever eaten in these places is so good it's it it's unbelievable there's even like a little pub in brighton a little queer pub in uh in brighton that is owned by um jd remember uh brighton gin kathy caton yeah. Yeah. so they yeah. open they open their own little pub and it only seats like maybe oh. 16 people oh. maybe uh, oh. maybe 16 and they had uh like a whole roast dinner that was gluten-free and it was made with like um oyster mushrooms and they even oh. had big Yorkshire pudding that was gluten free, like big old uh -oh. Yorkshire. And and I I got it in solidarity with my wife, but I thoroughly enjoyed it. <laughs> I think I think if it's done right, it's really good. But it's also really hard to find, you know, really hard to find like a a, a well done meal that's vegan and gluten free. But we yeah. we find them and we go. <laughs> we yeah. Go. But um, yeah, I think it's challenge. Uh, yeah. yeah. It's the it's right. Oh, yeah. yeah, exactly. It's a I, chef with Gemma. Yeah, exactly. I, I don't cook for her anymore. She's on her own. But the thing of it is, is the things that they do well here in London, I will say they do well, like fish and chips. You are not going to get fish and chips like that anywhere else. Right? No. Yeah. Solid. Yeah. Solid. Yeah. 50 feet, 50 feet from my front door. Best fish and chip shop ever. Oh, so like, thank you. Yeah, yeah. But it's it's just... Are I, you from New York, Chelsea? I'm sorry, Denise. No, I've been there for 10 and a half years. But I, I'm not oh, from there. I'm actually from here in South Florida. Oh, wow. Oh, I was you are. Uh, yeah. I, um... Okay. I, um... I grew up down here, but I was born in Charlotte, North Carolina. And so, uh, but my parents moved here when I was very young. So I don't remember North Carolina all that much, except for running out in the freezing cold while my mom was sleeping in my diaper and hanging out and building snowmen on the front yard. But <laughs> that was the only memory that I really b remember. And she was like, oh my God, where's Josie? Where's Josie? And I was like out in the Aww. snow, sitting, <laughs> sitting in the snow in a diaper. Just oh like out on the front yard, on the lawn, you know, just building a snowman, minding my own business. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's, <laughs> hey, it was fun, you know. I and read, then, yeah, I read that you were lived in New York, uh, but I guess I was listening, like, I'm thinking you don't sound like you come from New York. So that makes sense. You live there, but you didn't grow up there. So. Correct. <laughs> Did you go to, and a half. Go to so culinary you, school? It, it, it makes me an honorary New Yorker. An honor. Yes. Yeah. Where yeah, did, you, did you go to school there? Like, did you go to culinary school there? Or? I did go to culinary school in New York. That's where I really sewed my culinary roots. Um, I went to the New York restaurant school and uh, which became the Art Institute of New York City. And then uh, I graduated at the top of my class and I represented my school in Vegas uh, for the San Pellegrino, almost famous chef competition. Oh, wow. And that was, oh. you know, that's what started it all. And then, um, you know, and then after that, I got all these really good gigs, uh, stages, which are like apprenticeships uh, with really great chefs. Uh, the first chef that I was able to work with was Wiley Dufresne. And, uh, you know, he's WD50. And he was the guy who who transformed the Lower East Side. And he's the one who introduced casual fine dining to the world. Um, he took all the fine dining techniques, ingredients and, and integrity, and he brought it into a casual environment, rock and roll, where you could just come in with your jeans and your t-shirt. You still were gonna throw down, you know, $150 a person, but like, it was going to be worth it, you know? Um, and I was able to stage with him, apprentice with him for, for almost like eight months. And I wanted to work with him, but nobody ever left that guy. He was like a teacher. He was a mentor. Yeah. I mean, he had the cleanest kitchen in the world. Never, I've never seen a kitchen like this ever again in my life, except in my own. But <laughs> it was like, um, you know, it was like, uh, working in a laboratory at, at any time during service there was never a crumb on the floor there was never 
everything was always we have a we have a term that we use in the culinary world it's called mise en place and that means that everything in its place and for sure he's the one who stamped mise en place into my brain forever engraved engraved it into my psyche and 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 uh, he was definitely the foundation for what it is. I come from pedigree. So, you know, from him, I went to Dan Silverman. Um, and uh, no, sorry, I, I followed his, in his footsteps and I went to Jean George. And I, I worked for Jean George for a year, but, you know, uh, maybe a year and a half. But, you know, there was not a lot of money in that. And I was living in New York and that was back then, but still, you know, making. 875 an hour was not going to cut it, you know, but you, <laughs> yeah, you worked in these places. And, and I, I went from being a line cook, uh, like Garmage, which is where you start is like in the cold section. Right. And I, I excelled because I, I was right next to the Poissonnier, which was the fish guy, you know, and I would just, you know, always look whenever I wasn't doing my station, I'd be standing there right in his, you know, in his in his station, like watching everything that he did. And one day that chef was sick. <coughs> so they needed someone to jump in. Oh, my God. That's like, wow. Thank God you were paying that, attention. Yeah, that was my yeah, cue. Really? <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, I said, OK, I got this chef. And they were like, all right, give Josie a chance. I jumped over there. And like you don't usually go to Poissonnier because that's the most expensive station, you know. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Your, awesome. your, you know, your, your seafoods and your fishes and everything, right? Correct. Yeah, the Ooh. lobsters, all the like high ticket items, and you have to really take care of that that station, and you have to know how to handle that, uh, you know, care for it, put the seafood away right, rotate it. You need to know how to cook it. You can't overcook it. Um, <clears throat> and then that's sorry guys <clears throat> but that was like that was my first um <clears throat> my first I guess opportunity to show my stuff yeah and I had a real delicate touch with the fish I took it very seriously and then the chef you know realized and then I moved and I kept on moving through all the stations and I had a proficiency for those those stations because I was hungry you know I wanted to be a chef you know and then learn I didn't come it, out of it. Yeah. school to be a line cook you know yeah. but um you know when I went to the chef and his name was uh well we won't say but <laughs> he was an Alsatian he was an Alsatian chef and so he'd be like Josie, I, I need this right now, you know, and oh, I don't want to see. Oh, blah, 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 blah. and he was the kitchen that every single piece of equipment had a price tag on it. So if ah. you broke it, you paid oh. for it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. And, you know, and he used to love and to scream. And I, I went to him. I said, hey, chef, can I have a moment with you? And he's like, okay, Jesse, uh, I will be available later this afternoon. <laughs> and I said, well, can, um, all right, cool. So I went to him. I go, hey, chef, look, you know, I've been working real hard. I've been moving through all the stations. Look, I got to make more money, you know? And I got this opportunity in Brooklyn. They want to make me like the kitchen manager. They want to pay me like $1,200 a week, you know? And that would really help out. But I don't want to just go and get a job for the money. I just need you to take me at least to $10 an hour, you know, and I'll figure it out. Like, but I, I'll, I'll stay because it's worth it to me, you know, um, but I really need you to to meet me there. And I was making eight seventy five. OK, so it was like a dollar twenty five. I was, yeah, was going to say for not asking that. for a lot. Yeah. Not a lot, you know, and he goes, oh, I don't know if I can do that, Josie. I'm so sorry, but uh, I don't know. And I said, you don't know if you can give me a dollar twenty five more. I'm like, dude, I like I live in New York. You know, I just got out of school. I got bills to pay. I can't pay it working here 40 hours a week and then going home like this is not this is not going to work for me, you know, and <laughs> I was like, all right, well then, if you can't give me a dollar twenty-five, then I'm giving you my two weeks, you know. And I, that, like yeah. that's wow. what happened. Badass. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so, Badass. unfortunately, like I didn't get to stay 
in these kitchens that I really wanted to stay in because the monies were not there for me, you know? Yeah. And I, I wanted to stay there and I wanted to learn and I wanted to do all of those things, but I didn't have daddy paying my rent in New York City, you know? And yeah. a lot of the kids that were in these fine dining restaurants, they had the, you know, they had the family support. I just didn't have it. Yeah. And so, yeah. you know, I paved, I, I guess you could say I paved my own path through the culinary world and I took opportunities where I could. I learned, I self, I'm self, i self-taught, you know, beyond culinary school and beyond the kitchens that I was able to be a part of. But, you know, I everything I've learned, I've learned because I was hungry for, for knowledge and I was willing yeah. to, to make mistakes. And, uh, you know, uh, when YouTube came out, you know, that YouTube was a great thing. All the cookbooks, I have a huge collection of cookbooks. And, you know, you just try on these recipes and then you take those recipes and then you uh, take some of the technique that you use um, and you start to understand like, OK, well, this is the technique for making bread. OK. Well, now I want to make bread that has chives and olives in it. You know what I mean? And so you take those basic yeah. bread recipes and then you start working them, you know, and you start working it and you're like, you know, and oh, let me taste this. And you, you do it the first way. All these cookbooks, yeah, they all have recipes, but all the recipes are that great, you know? So, <laughs> um, <laughs> you just, yeah, you just do it, you know? I think you that's know, the, the fact that putting your stamp on it, you know, putting your stamp on something right. that you've already, you've learned the basics, but now you're going to put your stamp on it. And that's what makes you, you like, I, I am so ridiculously addicted to like Netflix food shows, yeah. chef's table. Yeah. I, I, I think I've been, yeah. through, I just finished noodles. Like I've been through pizza. I've been through, I, I just been through all of them. But it, what it seems like to me is that every chef, whether they're a Michelin star chef or, you know, grassroots starting from the beginning, self-taught, whatever, and that have risen through the ranks, the, the point of it is, I think, is to create things that are unique to them. And now they've passed those on to their customers. And now they have this loyal fan base, you know, and they all have such interesting stories you know, like I, I'm, I'm always amazed at people that are on the, like, you know, walking around with 12 bucks in their pocket, you know, and that are on the brink of being arrested and just flee to Italy and learn everything there is to know about handmade pasta. And then come right. And, right. That's funky, funky story and come back and, and have this amazing restaurant that's now in Beverly Hills and celebrated for making handmade pasta for every dish. And it's just, yeah, like, that's why, yeah, yeah. There with the people who want to be rock stars and they just go play on the corner with a, a their guitar case open for tips yeah. and then they become discovered. But, you know, they, they had no money to do that. But yeah. like when I like, like the fact that you took the initiative to look at the person next to you and learn that. And then when you had your opportunity, when he was sick and he couldn't be there, that's the making of a rock star because that's the difference between the people that succeed and the people that don't succeed because they don't take those opportunities to learn and take it upon themselves. Like that was badass that you did that and you were ready. Like you have to learn it to be ready, you know? Like yeah. um, I think that that really says volumes Especially since, like you said, you didn't have the money to be able to afford to work for such little money that they give you, which is ironically the same thing with the music business. Like I'm hearing like the same thing because it's an, like another thing in the arts, making food, you know, like being a chef is they, you don't get paid like enough to live to uh, learn your hone your craft. You know, people are playing in the bar for free um, in Nashville or for tips. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I get that. I can relate to that from that standpoint. But how cool is it that you were ready because you knew to learn it because you were there and you took whatever you could while you were there? It Amazing. is a thirst. I mean, it's a thirst, you know, like it, when you 
I think when you decide what your passion is, the next step is to learn everything you can about it and know that that doesn't stop. You know, like you keep learning, even, even when you're at your peak, you're, you, you keep learning and that's what, that's what, you know, keeps you at your, at a, at a peak level. So what, what do you think you've come away with at this point in your life? Is it, I, I want to own my own restaurant. I want to give this a shot again. I need to find a better location. Or is it making tutorial videos for people that are starting out? I mean, do you know what your next step might be? Yeah. So I love that you ask because, uh, you know, the reality of it is this, you know, I just spent nine years owning my own restaurant and that was my dream to have one, you know? And I mean, that's every chef's dream, right? Is to have their restaurant. Um, and, you know, it had its it had its ups and it had its downs. And man, I'm going to be forever grateful for the community who supported, you know, me, us through it all. And, um, you know, that was my baby. It was hard for me to let it go. But it was just time, yeah. you know. The, the industry has shifted. It's changed. Uh, after COVID, you know, it's hard to find the... Uh, the, the, you know, the right back of the house staff, you know, because um, listen, you know, when you're a little restaurant, you know, you can pay someone $15 an hour, which is, uh, you know, a living wage, as everyone says here. Mm -hmm. and, and, and minimum wage is 10 bucks, you know what I mean? So it's like, that's whatever. But uh, so to even compete as a small restaurant, you got to pay people at least 15 an hour. Yeah. And then you know, if you have a little restaurant, let's say you don't have a a, um, a liquor license, you know, uh, so you, you're you're serving only beer and wine. It really shifts. You got to get super creative. I have this great idea. It's unfortunate. Uh, the reopening was my reopening was supposed to be bringing this new concept and this new way of doing restaurants to the forefront. But I think it's just it was just time. <clears throat> unfortunately, this year was a very transformational moment for me. Uh, you know, um, you know, I, I ended um, a 10 year relationship that I had been, oh, you know, wow. in and, and married and that just happened, you know, so, you know, I'm four months out of that. And yeah. um, oh, wow. it was, it was very social media about that. Did you post a reel or something on social media? about that i think i saw uh, I, that it um i posted you know like a a, a goodbye post you know like just um yeah like a conscious uncoupling kind of thing you know yeah. um yeah. you know we you know you you people grow apart you know what i mean and and it's unfortunate and you know it was an emotional moment for me and I wish her the best but it was very emotional for me over the last four months and on top of that the restaurant had closed for the renovation we you know we were facing a very slow summer and it was just really hard to kind of catch up so I shut it down and you know then I started you know I, I stepped into a divorce you know and then it was it was like whoa you know it was just like so much at once and you know again remember I was telling you about the the audience you know so it's not yeah. like you just this by yourself and like you can be human by yourself and you can have your emotions your breakdowns yeah. and all that stuff and yeah. like go through it you know no you go through it and everybody's paying attention and watching you and commenting and asking them all, you know it's just like a lot it's very and public. Then, yeah it's very public and then try you know we're we're part of a very small knit uh community so that's you know it was it was it was just hard to navigate through it all and uh, there were some, you know, major missteps that we we made during the uh, like this was my first business. I, 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 you know, I don't I don't I don't claim to be, uh, um, you know, a Harvard grad or anything, but I just, mm -hmm. you know, there were mistakes that we made. I learned from those mistakes. Now we're moving on and the next business is going to be set up way differently. That's for sure. <laughs> but, uh, you know, um all that being said, you know, you talk about like one thing, right? One thing, uh, a divorce after a long-term relationship, one thing like that could like floor a human being, you know, oh, yeah. you don't, it, 
but you don't know, right? right. And then your restaurant closing and that right. happening simultaneously. And and I was yeah. trying, trying with all of my power to really like bring it back to life. I had this restructuring, uh, this rebranding, this reconcept and reconnection to my to my to my vision, the initial vision of what bubbles and pearls. I was actually, you know, attached to the name even, you know, thinking that my yeah. people wouldn't just come and just like, oh, yeah, Bubbles and Pearls and like whatever. They needed to see Bubbles and Pearls reborn. And I wanted to do, re I wanted to give Bubbles and Pearls the chance to be reborn. It's just not this time around. And um, I got some opportunities. I'm, I'm headed out to Egypt. So, uh, you know, um, yeah, they, they flew me out. To, to help, uh, you know, this beautiful, uh, it's called the Noon Goddess. It's this beautiful, ancient style, luxury sailboat that travels down the Nile River and temple hops. Okay, that's what I've got to say, right? It's temple hopping. And it's, you know, a spiritual journey. It's like a floating temple, uh, but it brings mind, body, spirit to this entire journey. I was invited to help a friend who built this boat, uh, just get the kitchen staff up to speed when it comes to the international clientele that we have as guests on the, sh on, on the boat. And I fell in love with the place. They fell in love with me. We all fell in love. And now, uh, they are inviting me back and, and I'm going to be, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm executive producer on a, on a cooking show right now. And, um, and I'll be hosting it with the, the top chef, Middle East winner, plus this other cool Egyptian chef, Chef Marwa. And I, I'm going to tell you, man, I fell in love with this culture. And now we're going to get to do this in a way that's like reflective, introspective, cultural, spiritual journey. You know, it's going to be beautiful with the backdrops and the landscapes. And it's going to, oh. it's just going to be so rich. And the idea is that we're going to be, fostering a table towards peace oh, and perfect it's like, yeah yeah peace in the middle oh, east yeah. you know yeah. And, yeah and and this this to me is is bigger than what i'm doing in this little restaurant right here yeah. you know oh, so when so when one door closes like i said 20 more open that are made for you and yeah. And you know, I, that means that, like, what it, it seems like, because like I said, I, I am so addicted to, to food shows and especially ones that have to do with travel. But I, what I'm seeing though, is that it, it it's these, these quiet little pockets that people don't think um, about that often. Like if you mention, you know, um, cooking or, you know, I'm a chef for Michelin <laughs> stars, or like, Egypt doesn't come to mind. And that was watching right. something else um, with the, uh, is it Rocio Sanchez? That that chef, that she opened a place in Tulum. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, Tulum is like Mexico, but you don't think Tulum, you think Cabo and, you know, Karma de Playa yeah. and places like that. You don't think Tulum. So I think bringing attention to, the, to these new experiences is what people want right now. You know, they want to see that kind of stuff. That feels that feels like uh, a great decision, <laughs> really. Yeah. yeah so, the, the, the show, like being on the show, is that the show? I'm sorry? Is that the, being on the ship? Being on the ship, is that the show? Is that is that separate from the show that you're doing, the cooking show, or is that the show? Well, that's our that's going to be our vessel. That takes Perfect. us I'm from the, for, the no, South that's River. awesome. Yeah, that's, that's it's so cool. The the container for this Egypt, uh, you know. What is the concept? And we're gonna be bringing like you know artists and visionaries and thinkers and uh, you know just you know maybe some politicians, all of these kind of people. To, to sit at these tables so we can have, because I believe that like food connects us all, right? And there's something to be said about the kind of conversation that you can have 
when the food is good. When when the food is on the table, all of our defenses are down. We're not we're not concerned with our problems. When you're eating something delicious and you're having that experience, the conversation around that table is rich. That conversation around that table when curated could create solution. And like I want to just have really good conversation and expose really uh, this culture that I think for the West, you know, we have this misconstrued idea of what the Middle East is, you know, and Egypt is a part of the Middle East, you know, Dubai is a part of the Middle East. And like, there's Mm. all these other like very, very metropolitan, I'll say, um, progressive thinking type yeah. of, of countries in the Middle East. And it's not all the the war, you know, uh, the battlefields, you know, and it's important to recognize how these neighboring c- countries are, how they see this, how they see this conflict constantly happening and how it's affecting everyday life. And we think that it's not safe to fly. Like I never ever thought before, like Egypt wasn't on the top of my list only because I was under the idea, right? That, oh, I can't go to the Middle East, it's too dangerous. And oh, as a woman, I'm gonna have to wear, you know, blah, 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 you know, I'm gonna do all this stuff. That was not my experience in Egypt. In a matter of fact, Cairo has 30 million people, okay? And you know, there's like, it's one of the biggest cities in the world. And like, yeah, sure. It's, it's not like New York, right? Because it's 30 million people and there's a lot going on there, right? <laughs> but there's intense culture. There's like extreme, uh, you know, um, commitment to like growing. Egypt wants to grow. They want to not just westernize themselves, but they want to... They want to bring some of the more modern, modern, I guess you could say, uh, uh, amenities to the, you know, to the, to, to their, to their culture, adopt a few things, you know, and they're very, it's a poor country right now. Like it's 48 Egyptian pounds to one U.S. dollar. So you're rich in Egypt. Yeah. 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 But. You know, it's funny, though, too, because a lot of people say, oh, you know, um, they'll say, oh, um, yeah, that's 48 pounds. But, you know, the Egyptians are not stupid. They know if you're American, they're going to charge. It's like 48 pounds. They're they're just doing the math, you know, and they're like five times 48. I want five dollars for that, you know. So yeah. now, you know, that's right. 2,000 Egyptian pounds, you know, or 200 yeah. and something Egyptian pounds. And yeah. you're still paying five bucks for it. But it's not like, it's not $50 that you would be spending in the United States. You know what I mean? Yeah. I just never understand yeah. when traveling how how everything can be so cheap. Uh, <laughs> and, it's, it, I, it is. It's a different, it's a, you know, I think my, my, my neighbor went to Egypt, um, I think it was two years ago. And, and at that time, you know, things were bad over there. And I was like, are you sure you, you, yeah. you want to go? Like, will you, you know, keep in touch with us? Let you know, keep me posted. And he's like, oh, we're not going to like the Rafa border, you know, <laughs> where, where they're having all kinds of problems. We're, we're going to Cairo, you know, we're going to the tourist spots and the temples. Oh, yeah. and- it's like, so my, because right, right. you're so conditioned to what you see on the news, you know, and that was my first right. thing. And I was like, oh my God, I forget that there's a whole world outside of that, that exists. And then to find out that Egypt and um, Qatar and um, uh, Saudi Arabia, everybody are in on these peace talks, you know, it's not just. Israel that's that's fighting with Lebanon and and Gaza and all that and and it's not just the United States that's there trying to broker a deal it's all these Middle Eastern places that have the right. same concerns as the United States so when you say you're going to sit at these tables and talk I assure you you will hear solutions you really will hear solutions you'll hear a yeah. different take 
on what we are conditioned and what we see. It's going to be so interesting, Josie. Oh my God, I wish you the best on that. Thank, Thank you so much. Going, I'm going back November 3rd to um, to shoot the pilot. pilot. Oh you my should God. bring your alchemist friend in London to that, to sit at the <laughs> table. Oh, he is. He's coming. He's a part of it. And I, I'm going to I, I, I'll shoot you guys the information, but go check him out. Uh, Neo Hart is his is yeah. his name, H E A R T, and he's a musician, an artist, and oh my God, this this um this deck is I don't I don't know maybe I have it, but it's just like if if you see it, it's so beautiful, and uh, yeah, and we're gonna be bringing music on board too, so it's like that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to do the whole uh you know music art. The art, the arts, because culinary right. arts is a part of it. it and is. I, yeah, I'm a DJ yeah. when I'm when I'm not I'm not in the kitchen. I'm a DJ, Lady Snack Daddy, yeah. right here. You know, I saw that. So, yes. What <laughs> are we just finding this out? Oh my god. Yeah. So <laughs> I do a lot of different things, and I love music. And music when when I'm I'm prepping. We have the radio blasting. <laughs> I caught the guys in Egypt and they were like, chef, music? I was like, hell yeah, let's go. And, you know, my my, <laughs> my my girlfriend right now, she's in a band, you know, and she's the lead singer for a Led Zeppelin tribute band. Oh, my God. They're called oh, Airwaves to Heaven. That? Airway to Heaven? Oh. Airwaves. Yeah. Airwaves to Heaven. Perfect. Yeah, and she always tells everybody, she tells everybody on stage, she's like, you guys, if it isn't a, sorry if there are any kids watching this, but if, if you know, it's like, hey, you know, hey guys, if if it isn't a fuck yes, then it's a no, okay? <laughs> That's how I've been living my life right now. If it's not a fuck yes, because we know, we know guys, when you know when something's lukewarm, Forget about the lukewarm life. Like, why yeah. are we doing that? Yeah. Just listen to your heart. Listen to your soul. Listen to the things that like light you up and turn you on. Like, wake up in the morning because you're excited to be alive. Like, what yeah. is your fuck yes? And find it. Let's get it. You know? I love and that. everybody knows what their fuck yes is. Everyone knows it. You know, you know, like, hey, do I want vanilla? or chocolate tonight, you know? And they're like, no, nah, you know, I don't know. I feel like Rocky Road. Rocky Road's a fuck yes for me tonight. <laughs> Go with your fuck yes, you know? <laughs> I love it. Oh, my God. I love your um, outlook of um, closing the door and moving on to new stuff and not looking back. It's such a, a healthy, amazing, like, way to live, really, because yeah. things come in life. And you have to like be able to lift yourself up and look for something better and just as exciting or more exciting. I think that's awesome. That is just awesome. Yeah, that's I have to look that for the great news. I think I you know what I want. I, I think we should end on that note because I love the fuck yeah, the fuck yeah way of doing yeah. things. And I'll tell you something else. You guys are in that's Florida, fair. and early voting started. So make sure you get your sexy asses. There you go. You already voted. Good. I was going to say, you're, you're gone. You're going to be gone. Well done. Well done. Listen, yeah. Yeah. I, want you to, I want you to check in with us and keep us posted um, yeah. with Please. everything that's happening. And thank you so much for taking the time out um, I, I during all imagine. of this. Yeah. I can imagine you're getting ready to go. Um, but we look forward to seeing how this journey goes for you. Totally. Well, thank you guys for thank having me on. It. And I look forward to having many more conversations with y'all. I'll send you my my digits so you can yeah. just call me direct, okay? And Perfect. stay in touch. Let me know what's going on with you. Let me let me cross promote, okay? Excellent. Fuck yeah. Yes, totally. <laughs> Fuck yeah. <laughs> Fuck yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Love Have it. a great night. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Bye. Why do you always run back to the love you once knew? You're addicted to a touch, that's true. My addiction. And I confess, my addiction. My addiction.